Arthur, what about the experience of depth as profundity? I mean, that, that people have. I mean, depth, to see things deeply or to experience things deeply also means to experience them more fully in a way. Yes, but <coughs> that's a, a higher degree of what I'm talking about. In fact, that we use experience in depth as an amplification of what I'm saying. To, uh, w w the, the surface view you have is superficial. I see you doing it. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to do my thing. The superficial dimension is surface, what, uh, that display thing. Right. And uh, that's not to put it down. It has value for certain things, like analysis. But that's what superficial means, is yes. sur surfacial, on the surface. Right. But it, I'm, I'm not to discredit <laughs> right. it. I'm saying that the dimension of depth complements it and gives it a different kind of value, uh, or con a different con contribution, contribution of value, which is not, you can't get value from two dimensions. You would think you could get more from two dimensions than you could from one, but in some respects you get less. For instance, you go to the broker and say, what's the best stock? And he may pull out a lot of tables and say, General Motors is going to have a stock split. On the other hand, they're beginning to lose markets in foreign countries, uh, so maybe Chrysler is, is low now and it may go up. On the other hand, uh, the uh, better stay out of the automobile market and buy uh, electronics, which is really up and coming industry. So he gives you a lot of alternatives and you could spot these around on a relationship, but it does not tell you which is the best stock. That was the simple question you mm -hmm. You asked him, and of course he can't say. He, he fills you out with a lot of information, and this is much what we get. The uh, answer is time will tell, <laughs> and time is depth. Well, of course, by that time we don't, it's too late. Right. Um, at any rate, that's a good occasion to a amplify this difference between value knowledge and uh, relationship knowledge, which is surface knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'd rather not call it superficial knowledge because that's a, a downer. That's no, you mean it's planar, two-dimensional? Planar, yes. Uh, s uh, surface uh, in one dimension. It's what you could see in a picture. Mm -hmm. But a picture is different from the reality. There's something else I'd like to say about time which comes, it's uh, timely now, because of Bergson, uh, the revival of Bergson. Mm -hmm. They've pulled him out of the grave, and I'm afraid they'll just bury him again, and maybe f more permanently even. But they've at least realized, the process philosophers, that Bergson was an important philosopher. And they've had this conference on Bergson in Galveston, to which many physicists were asked. And uh, they were saying that Bergson had anticipated quantum physics, and uh, he's turning out, he argued with Einstein way back, and, and they're now saying Bergson was correct. What, well, was, the, what was the issue? Uh, the issue was the symmetry of time, or asymmetry. Bergson insisted that time was becoming, it was not symmetrical, it was different in the past and the future, whereas science is forced to say it's symmetric because, because the formulas don't make a distinction between the direction of time. Yeah, this is a pretty much the same distinction you're talking about as right. between time and the spatial dimensions. That's exactly the thing, and I just didn't realize, and it wasn't so much longer, I think it was 1919 that Bergson said this, and. I was thinking it in 1926 when I was doing relativity. Uh, that this was, and this was the reason for my theory of process, because I wanted it to say that you could not account for the universe as a structure in time and space. It was 
a structure in space which changed through time and you couldn't anticipate it. And uh, of course I've emphasized novelty, but Bergson included the novelty in the becoming. He said there's a perpetual novelty occurring. And one of the writers, Capek, I think it was, uh, describing Bergson, described it as droplets of novelty on, this, on the line of time. Uh, I've yeah, we're on now. What's on? Yeah, okay. Good. Now, now just lean forward and change your glasses. So you want to continue about Bergson? Yes, it's... Uh, he has this uh, f feeling of the difference between the time dimension and the space dimension which I think is so important. But there's a point more that I was coming to with the, novel, the drops of novelty. Uh, if I were more careful, I would have said, Bergson talks about duration as distinct from time. Uh, I frankly admit that I didn't get this on my reading of Bergson in ancient times. You but mean ancient times <laughs> meaning? Several years ago? Oh, reading in the 30s, 40s, whenever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I couldn't get it from Henry Stapp, who was trying to explain it to me. It wasn't until I read through several of these papers on the, on the conference that I got the idea, which were including quotes from Burks. Duration meant that time couldn't be reduced to a point. As it is, as is done in science. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't know about the quantum of action. I would equate those very short times, short durations, to quanta of action. But even quanta of action have frequencies. They have well, frequencies or periods. It's, it doesn't matter what you say. I mean, they're a very short period that can't be. When you reduce it, then you're in a quarter of a phase or a half a phase. You're not all the way around. You remember the big point in uh, that essay uh, of the Foundations of Science Adequate that we you helped me with? Yes. The big point was when I had this cycle of action or learning cycle going on outside of time. <laughs> How could you have a circulation and without space or a duration without time right and then I had to uh, say well this it's this is creating time it's in meaning space it's not in real time can you be a little bit more clear what what is creating time the the uh, cycle of action or the learning cycle which is this, this buzzing aroundness that the photon does. That the photon is doing. It's a learning cycle in the sense that it has phases. In other words, it starts with a blind action and then uh, goes through a reaction and then has a conscious reaction and then a conscious action. Those four phases are the learning cycle. But it means that anything from the photon on can be learning. Learning in its own terms, at its own much more rapid rate. How, how can you say that the photon is learning? I mean, what, what license have you? Uh, see, I invert the whole problem. How do you know what learning is? See, how do you define learning? I think the most satisfactory definition is to say it's a phase in a cycle. It's that point in a cycle when you uh, realize what you've done, and uh, then you you act accordingly. Now, if you use that to define time, instead of trying to define uh, try to define learning, so you can't define learning except in its terms of itself. Mm -hmm. So you make that basic and define times in terms of it, terms of it. Then you say, 
time is that which is required to learn, not clocks. So you're making learning a fundamental universal right, making, process. Right, you're learning the most fundamental thing. Uh, and I think that's perfectly legitimate, and it's actually better science than uh, taking time as the undefined term. Because you can't get from time to learning, but you can get from learning to time. Mm -hmm. Therefore, learning is the whole of which time is one of the phases or one of the aspects, space being another. The, the time gives the experience part of learning, and the space gives the intellectual or com rational part of learning, Comparison. where you compare one thing to another. Mm -hmm. And this also gives you gratis the possibility of acting intelligently, you see, acting on the basis of knowing. Because those then become the three phases. The first phase being the most neglected of all, the blind urge that has no explanation. See, that was what both uh, St. Georgie and Shapley said what was needed in science, something to account for the ongoing urge of life. Mm -hmm. So you get the whole package from this learning cycle which has all these aliases, quantum of, alias quantum of action, alias photon, alias quantum of uncertainty. It's beautiful, isn't it? Are you talking about the spin of the photon itself? Yes. And any spin must needs go through phases. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the two pi that's always uh, there in Planck's constant. Planck's constant is generally called h. And then if you take the 2 pi out, it's called h bar. And you couldn't take the 2 pi out if it wasn't there. The other way to see it is that it's angular momentum. Oh, that's another alias. I forgot <laughs> that. But angular momentum is something going around like a skater uh, buzzing around this way. And they, when they pull the weights in and they speed up and so mm -hmm. forth. That, that's angular momentum. Um, what's 2 pi for the folks? <laughs> oh, 2 pi is the universal circle, the symbol of the circle, uh, the wholeness. You see, remember the ancients were always talking about the planets had to go in perfect circles. Mm -hmm. This was an insight into the wholeness of, of the circle as unity. Kepler discovered, oh no, it wasn't a circle, it was an ellipse. But the fundamental insight of circularity uh, was uh, basic to meaning, even if it was not sufficient or adequate for astronomy. <laughs>